Great. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Julie Ipe. I'm a senior director at the Clean Cooking Alliance, and I'll be moderating our panel today, uh, which is on the household value proposition for clean cooking. Um, and so we'll be talking with companies about how they identify their target customer base, how they grow their markets, and what CCA and other clean cooking advocates the government and others can do to help them accelerate uh, demand for clean cooking and help this transition go faster. Um, so we have a great panel today. We have three speakers who I would say at this point are, are truly veterans of clean cooking and have been thinking about how to attract customers to their products for quite some time now. Um, and they represent a range of solutions. So we should have a really interesting discussion. We have uh, Greg Murray from Coco Networks. We have Peter Scott from Bernie Manufacturing, uh, Rocio Perez Ochoa from Bidhasasa. Um, and I will let them uh, introduce themselves in more uh, detail in a moment. Um, but I thought I would first provide a bit of context for our discussion today um, and perhaps start by humbly arguing that this is one of the most important topics of the conference, because ultimately if we cannot convince people of the value of clean cooking products, if we can't convince them that they are worth their hard earned and often limited resources, resources. And if we can't provide solutions that are convenient and easy to use um, and save people money, then ultimately we will not succeed, right? Um, and our challenge there is significant. Um, we are up against a lot of factors. We have affordability barriers. We have lack of infrastructure in a lot of countries. Um, we have gender and power dynamics within households. And we also have this impossible task of trying to solve for a number of other factors with clean cooking, um, from improving health to striving towards renewable energy. Um, and on top of all that, we have the biological reality that uh, we as humans are, are sort of hardwired to resist change, um, particularly when it presents us with uncertainty, requires a lot of effort um, and loss of control. So we have a big challenge ahead of us, um, but I'm super excited um, about our panelists today because um, they have tried a number of, of creative and different approaches on, on how do you solve for this issue and how do you create products that are truly attractive to, to consumers and, and how do you market them accordingly. So super excited um, uh, to discuss today. I will also just say that um, we will uh, have a, a discussion for about 30 minutes and then uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then open it up for Q&A. Um, but there's no need to hold your questions until the end. So please feel free to um, to uh, send those through throughout the, the session. So with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Greg, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Greg, uh, leading Coco. Um, and for, for those of you on the previous session, I did, did the five minutes to overview the company, but focusing on the household value proposition. So what we're doing is, um, is retailing a, a solution, a, a, an ethanol stove, uh, ethanol fuel, and a way of, um, of, of buying fuel, um, a way of, uh, a way of uh, refilling your stove, you know, a range of behaviors that are, that are different. Um, so a solution that's different, it's a new category, it's a new brand, it's a new product, and involves a whole bunch of different behaviors. Um, and, and so definitely, you know, definitely, uh, you're actually, it's, it's not, uh, it's not straightforward. You, you can't just sort of put it on the shelf and assume it's going to walk off because it is, you know, it's market development that's required for a new category. And, but it's, it's, it's not something that hasn't been done before for other new categories that have emerged. You know, it, 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 you know if you're familiar with the, the sort of the, the, the technology adoption or diffusion uh, curves, it, it, it looks a lot like that. You have, you know, innovators, the first two, 3% of folks that, that, that will like it, um, that will take a big risk. And then you have early adopters and then you have the early majority and, and so on and so forth and, until it just becomes something that's second nature. And so we're seeing that because we have geospatial awareness of, of, of where our customers are because of the, 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 the NFC chip embedded into the neck of the canister that shows the, you know, that we have a metering system. So we, we sort of understand based on based on our you know, mapping uh, of the entire city, our understanding of you know, households in a particular neighborhood, our, our, our network density, we, we sort of know the penetration that we have 
in quite a quite a granular sense, and we're seeing we're seeing um, on on a on a neighborhood by neighborhood level, on a sub neighborhood by sub neighborhood level, we're seeing that th those different stages of technology adoption, because it is ultra local. That you know, the, the, particularly because of the dynamics of word and word of mouth, and so you know, in aggregate, we're about five six percent of our uh, of the city of the area that we have uh, coverage of is is, uh, is 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 what we've. Uh, what we've managed to convert so far, but there are certain neighbourhoods where at 15, 20% adoption already. And, and those neighbourhoods, we just don't really have to do a lot of work anymore because the word of mouth engine is going on and, and, and off we go. Whereas when we're starting up or we're setting up in a new neighbourhood, you know, there's, there's just no real other way to do it other than a bit of a street war where we're doing, you know, we're, we, TV, radio, outdoor in terms of a brand establishment and, and getting people to understand we are a big company where we have modern technology, we're not going to go anywhere. You know, the fuel's always going to be there, right? And so there's there's part of that, uh, and then and then the solution itself. You know, in the market, there's a. You know, it's probably fair to say that the from a consumer experience perspective, the the gold standard um, in their mind, uh, and something that's a category that's really well understood is there'll be there'll be gas, yeah, and and. Uh, uh, and of course, there's affordability challenges, and of course, there's safety challenges, particularly in markets like Kenya, where it's majority illegally refilled without without you know revalidation of the cylinders and, and so on. So there is some pain points in consumers' minds around LPG, but they you know they know what it is, and the experience that consumers want, um, which is not different to the experience that um, that I want when I cook, or you, Julie, or any of us. You know, you want to be able to 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 have you know really powerful heat. You want to be able to do multi burner cooking, right? Uh, two things concurrently to save time. You want to be able to regulate the heat output. You want to be able to turn the thing off. You don't want it to cause fumes. You know, there's a lot of basic universal wants that exist. Um, and a, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the myth around um, behavior and, 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 and people's, you know, attachment to charcoal and all this, th this is, this is, this is a lot of um, stuff that's been spewed by folks that haven't found product market fit in solving for basic consumer pain points. And if you can actually solve those you know, normal universal pain points and do it in a way that's affordable and, and, and convenient, then, then, then yeah, you can find those early innovators and then you can find those early adopters. And then, and then it becomes, you know, the, the, in the neighborhood, uh, the, the, our agents, our shopkeeper partners, um, the 700 shopkeeper partners, you know, they, they liken it to, the early days of M-Pesa adoption, of mobile money adoption here. What a strange idea, right? That you just go and text someone some money and, and those poor guys that had to go and do the hard slog in the first year of actually going convincing shopkeepers and customers to do something as fundamental as, 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 as remittances up country and so on using a, using a mobile phone. Uh, but then it just became just became the way it's done, and now it's second nature, and it's and it's adopted by you know all Kenyans, and 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 uh, and it's the Americans that come in that get wowed by this new way of doing things, right? Whereas it's it's second nature here, um, and and so we're seeing that in the air in the in the, in the neighborhoods and sub neighborhoods where we are above ten percent, fifteen percent, we're really you know we're really past the, even the early innovator and into that scaling phase at a sub neighborhood level, and uh, and yeah, and then you see see things like. Uh, you know, people to people selling. We have we have an app that people can earn commissions. It's referrals. You know, so self-managed you know sales teams effectively that are able to go and <clears throat> they might be um, small restaurateurs that are cooking with it, and they're able to have a side hustle. Kenya is the land of side hustles, and so they're able to go and earn extra income from us by executing on a sale without having to have the working capital requirements, the logistics, all of that stuff. All they need to do is do the person-to-person -person demonstration, so that people can feel the heat output and get comfortable around the tangibility of the solution. So there's you know, there's multiple approaches that we do that we use to, you know, to to fight that street war from the from from the from first principles. But but yeah, it's it's not it's not as easy as you know these things don't sell themselves in the first you know in the first, as, you, as, you, as you're climbing that hill. Um, but once you get the you know once you get the the thing rolling and, and where we are now in in Nairobi is it is you know it's just it's just very well understood. It's very well known um, and uh, and it's no longer new. And most customers that our sales team or our, or our agents are pitching. Um, have had the decision to buy de-risked by one or two people within their direct first level connection. Yeah, and so that that enables them to say, well, okay, well, I know. In fact, I've seen this. The demonstration stove is actually the the customer base. You know, we have all of these demo stoves out there, and that 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 is word of mouth, and we can incentivize that to supercharge that. But uh, but yeah, it's it, it's you know, I don't really know you know any other way to to go about it. It's certainly not e commerceable um, from a from a typical sort of American sense in the early days, you know, you can't just sort of put it online and run Facebook ads and you can't you can't put it on a shelf in, you know, in, in, in Carrefour or something and expect it's going to sell itself. It is it is, you know, proper 
um, uh, problem-based selling, uh, you know, understanding what the baseline fuel solution, which dirty fuel is being used, whether it's whether it's LPG, whether it's uh, charcoal, whether it's kerosene, and then and then being able to help you know help that customer discover you know the the, the fact that oh, actually I really don't like that, and I'd, I'd like you know I'd like what it is, and, and this is amazing and, and great, you know, and that's how that's how we do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's great to hear that you're past the sort of getting rolling phase, because I think that is really the hardest. Um, and as you say, you have a, a number of factors on your side uh, with ethanol and that it provides a lot of those things that you uh, what I that I could not agree more are certainly universal that people want convenience. They want um, something that heats up quickly and, and ultimately makes their life a little easier. So um, I, there's a lot to unpack there as, as well in what you just said, but I want to make sure we allow the, the other panelists to introduce themselves and, and give a little bit of an overview of their companies as well and um, and, and their target customers and, and how they've uh, thought about that and perhaps adapted over time. So let's move over to uh, Rocio, if you want to go ahead. Oh, uh oh! I think there's something wrong with your audio. What about now? Yes, now I can hear you. Perfect. It's always confused for some reason. I have two mm -hmm. microphones. Uh, don't ask me where, but it seems. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce myself in the company because I haven't really spoken before. So, uh, and I think it will be important to uh, understand where we are coming from as we are talking about consumers here. Um, I run uh, Bida Sasa, which is a distribution and finance company. So uh, we are not manufacturing stuff. So that's that's the this first disclaimer um, compared to many of the other presenters. Um, and obviously, we need to understand our customers really well. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to to operate. Uh, we are physically present in Western Kenya in the rural areas, um, and our our niche target market, which is not that niche, is rural women. Um, so we are going after the rural women as consumers of household goods in general. Uh, within the household goods uh, category, we are selling obviously cooking solutions, cooking devices, cooking technologies, uh, you name it. But we are also selling solar products and we are also selling agricultural equipment. And probably we, we will expand to other categories as our clients tell us that they, they really need things. We, we come from a premise of quality of life. Uh, there are products out there, there are technologies out there that have a strong impact on, on people's quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis. But for many reasons, they don't really reach the people that need them the most, especially the last mile, rural women, uh, low income. Um, they don't really have, they, they, they suffer from several barriers, including affordability, as you know, but also awareness and accessibility. So we do that. We try to overcome the typical barriers that you all very aware of by um, offering a range of household goods directly to the women um, and we sell them on credit. So one of the big things in our business model is that everything we do is around credit. Every single product that we sell has a payment plan attached to it and we are managing the, uh, the payment plan. So we are both distribution and a finance company together, not by choice. I don't want to be a bank and I don't recommend anybody to go into the banking industry but uh, the consumer finance for rural consumers is not there. You cannot go to your local bank and say, hey, uh, can I borrow $50? I want to buy a fancy stove. That's not happening. And it hasn't happened. It, and there's no sign of that happening. We've been operating for five years and we have not seen any improvement on the consumer finance side, um, as opposed to in India, uh, where we have seen, and, and Niha was talking about the finance side. So I think this is a very, very important um, problem that um, many of us based in East Africa face, and I don't see a solution for that. And so we are all reinventing the wheel on the finance side, call it pay as you go, prepaid, postpaid, bit by bit, uh, the standard loans or whatever, which is a bit of a shame because if the uh, financial industry got together, then we wouldn't have to do this, all these things. Um, and then on how we, as, as I said, we are targeting specifically rural women, which by the way, they are small for the farmers and hence uh, obviously the agricultural side is part of our catalog. Um, and how we do this, um, uh, Greg said it, right? This is, this is about solving a problem. So you don't really sell features, you sell benefits. 
uh, you don't sell megawatts, you don't sell, um, you know, ki kilocalories, you sell uh, how many hours of light I'm going to have or how many uh, hours I'm going to save from, clean, from cooking in this new device. Um, and this is very easy, in, especially when there is a, an economic uh, impact on the end user, I'm going to say 50% of the charcoal that I normally uh, spend is a no-brainer. People can do the math themselves. Uh, we offer payment plans, therefore, the math here is how much money I save on one side, how much money I have to spend on a monthly basis. As it happens, one is bigger than the other one, is completely uh, no you know, you don't have to uh, think it too much. Uh, the, the, the value proposition is there. On the solar space, pretty much the same, although the savings from kerosene are not as spectacular as the savings from, from the charcoal use. Um, which are spectacular, as charcoal, we all know, is very expensive. The LPG is less obvious. We also sell LPG. LPG, in fact, is our product number one uh, in terms of demand, uh, followed by the cookstoves. Um, the LPG is slightly different because the, the money savings are less obvious, as many people, or all of the people that we serve, they are first-time users of LPG, so this is harder to compare. But it saves so much time that they love it. So for our clients, time and, and, and money savings are very, very equivalent. If I don't spend three hours cooking every day and I only spend one hour cooking, I have two hours to do something else. And that is, uh, um, we, we, have, we have measured this, the both money savings and time savings has a strong correlation with repayment. Um, if the product doesn't do those two things or both things, we will think really hard before we add it into the catalog. Probably we will not add it into the catalog because selling is easy, especially when you are selling on, on credit. Um, you know, hey, $50 worth of equipment, but you only have to pay 10 today. Super easy. <laughs> Anybody can do that. The problem is getting repaid. Um, so we have a lot of emphasis on who we work with, uh, who we target and how we target, how we target them. The way we do it is, uh, Greg mentioned it already, uh, word of mouth. Word of mouth, word of mouth. Uh, we always joke that we don't have a marketing budget in the company, which is partially true, because we don't, we physically don't do very much marketing. Uh, we don't do radio campaigns, we don't do televisions, we don't print uh, pieces of paper that nobody ever reads. Uh, we rely on existing customers. Um, the best spokesperson, the best ambassador that you can find is a satisfied client. So we have developed a relatively complicated, sophisticated, uh, maybe too complicated referral system where the ladies that are happy with the, the purchase are the ones doing the awareness and the marketing for us. And they are also making sure that people pay on time. So this is all because we need to have the payments. It's not about selling, it's about getting paid. Um, and that works really well for us because they do the customer acquisition on our behalf, um, relatively um, low cost. We don't have to spend a fortune in customer acquisition, um, and it allows us to, or to develop the volumes that we need to make this, this uh, business valuable. We don't have the densities of um, the urban settings, so we need to be super, super careful with everything we do in terms of um, expenses and the operational cost of operating on, in the countryside are uh, horrendous, as you know. Um, you know, from moving stock from A to B, you know, if you don't bundle, forget about it. This is not a door-to-door business. You, you cannot do it on a door-to-door business because the, the cost associated with selling one store is that way too high. So um, we are specialists on bundling. We always work with groups of people. We don't work with individuals. And we leverage the existing networks that our clients already have within their communities. That's the way we operate. And I'll stop there. Thank you. That was a great overview. And um... Yeah, it sounds like you've really um, thought about how to address a lot of these barriers that we so often talk about within this sector, um, particularly in rural areas, um, in that you're solving for affordability, uh, thinking about how to make this accessible by bundling. Um, so that's um, all great to hear. Um, I want to maybe turn over to Peter, uh, just to allow him to introduce himself and, and tell us more about Burn and the latest there. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. I, I, yeah, like Greg, we were on the last panel, so I'm guessing the pe um, people saw that introduction. But yeah, I'm the CEO and founder of Burn. So we are Sub-Saharan Africa's biggest modern manufacturer of 
those. Um, and we make a variety of products from biomass to LPG to electric to uh, hybrid biomass uh, electric stoves. Um, I guess, you know, a, a couple things just, just out of the gate is that, you know, when we talk about stimulating demand, the one thing we definitely shouldn't think about, at least in the Kenyan market, is that we need to start work on like be, like um, uh, like awareness, general awareness campaigns. So I think like the, like uh, I think as Rocio uh, mentioned, like people are aware of it, they get the value proposition. The real challenge is they don't have the funds to make that purchase. So yeah, we did a study a while ago where we said like 30% of the population of Kenya wanted to buy a Jikokoa, they just couldn't afford it, and 70% knew the brand. So it's like there's at least in Kenya there's deep awareness, they understand but his price is a real uh, is a real challenge for them. Um, I guess the one thing some, I'm just trying to think of what's interesting for me to say about identifying target customers. You know, we have a, a big market research team, a big market intelligence team. And so we have a very um, intense iterative process between design, manufacturing, lab durability, and the user. So, I mean, we, we find the people that we think are our target customer. And then we workshop, you know, every change in the stove we run through with them. So, you know, we're not designing something in a lab in Colorado or Oregon or Vashon or Seattle, or whatever. It really, cause you know, you're, you're so often wrong. And I maybe well, one of the questions I guess we're gonna talk about later is like, what's the thing that I've learned about consumers? It's more what I've learned about myself, which is that I'm almost, I almost always get it wrong in terms of what I think the customer will want or need because, I, and then I have to validate through market research. So, you know, I'm constantly being surprised by that. So, um, but I think one thing that's been interesting for us is in the terms of, of customer journey. So we've done a lot of work on customer journey to understand how are people moving through fuels in the urban Kenyan market and I think there things were quite, it was quite surprising for us. So what we found is that sort of the POP people always start with kerosene. So they start with kerosene, then, you know, uh, when they get married or there's some, like if they make, make that small step up, then they'll move to charcoal then they'll make another step up and they'll go to LPG. But that we're really finding with people who have moved to LPG, they actually can't afford to do the refills. So then they go back down to charcoal and that's where they end up getting a Jikokoa, for example, is because, well, they're like, okay, we can't do, um, we can't do LPG. So now we're, we're stuck with charcoal. Let's use charcoal as efficiently as we can. And, you know, of course, our goal is not to sell a bajillion charcoal stoves. It's to try to provide people with a value. So whether it's charcoal, wood, LPG, or electric. Um, but again, yeah, it's, I mean, finding the target customer means like involving them at the beginning of that journey and that designing the product with them. Um, so yeah, may, maybe I'll, I'll, I feel like Greg and Rocio made a lot of really salient points. So I think I'm fine just to stop there and then we can go to the next. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get into to some more direct questions um, with each of you uh, uh, now. So maybe we'll turn it back to Greg. Um, and you already sort of touched on this earlier, but um, really wanted to sort of come back to this particular challenge that we have with ethanol in that um, for, for many consumers, it's an unfamiliar fuel. It's not something that they've seen before. So I have to imagine that uh, invites a lot of uncertainty for people if they've not seen their neighbors use it or if they've not seen family use it. Um, how do you overcome that? How do you, how do you get people just to really make what I would call a leap of faith and, and make this switch to ethanol? Yeah, so so like I mentioned, I mean it's 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 a leap of faith for the first person in a in a in a neighborhood block. Yeah, and they and they make that leap of faith on on first principles assessment, you know, you know, by actually touching and feeling and using the actual product. Yeah. So that's that is definitely a leap of faith for those innovators, those types of types of humans that exist in all parts of the world that uh, you know that are lean forward types around new technologies in, in general I'd, I'd, I'd argue that's a you know that's a characteristic of the Kenyan consumer over and above the uh, Ugandan or, 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 or perhaps a, a Tanzanian consumer if you had to generalize but but uh, one of the reasons that we we did choose uh, Nairobi as a place to build our first network was 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 because of this this um, re, you know this openness to a technology adoption if it can actually, fundamentally be proven to solve people's pain points. Um, 
so so yeah it is it is a leap of faith for the first you know for the first one two three ten within a within a neighborhood block um, but then it's not really for, for for the next folks it's not for their neighbors you know if you've got it and you know and and you've de-risked the decision for your 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 neighbor your mum, your sister um, and they see it you know suddenly we we get removed from the physical demonstration that is required around any new technology adoption particularly in this market um, suddenly the demonstration is occurring in some in one of our customers homes and so if you think about it you know we've now got you know just a huge amount of 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 salespeople right that are doing demonstrations through cooking every single day so it's no longer it's no longer new in the area that we have coverage it's no longer a leap of faith now it's consideration and can i afford it and you know, is is there? You know, and, and and definitely, it's a segmentation thing. Like any new technology, we went we 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 you know, category. We decided to go in at that sort of sort of middle income. You know, that that if you had to sort of uh, middle income is is in the two hundred three hundred dollar household income segment in 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 Nairobi, which is which is middle income. Uh, and clearly, there's a lot of folks that are below that. Uh, but but in order to establish a category and a new a new brand that is that is aspirational, we didn't want to go in with a um, cheaper product, which is which is possible, and a, a less functional product, which is possible. A one burner, for example, which is possible. We decided to go in and, and and give people what they actually wanted at a price point that is similar to you know the the retail price of improved charcoal stoves, um, which still have a lot of consumer pain points. They might save money, but they've still got smoke, and they 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 have issues with you know, being able to regulate the heat output and, and uh, you know, and still takes a long time to get ready. And there's a lot of sort of consumer, you know, behavioral pain points that, that we solve for, uh, that LPG solves for as well. Um, we also solve for, you know, things like, for, 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 and there are customers that switch over from one burner LPG to, to two burner cocoa and regard that as an upgrade as well, right? And, and, and why? Because, you know, you can have your kids cook with it. You know, often the folks that are, you know, that are, that are, that are you know, kids get from school and, and, and mum's locked away in the cupboard where the kid can't touch it, the, the one burner LPG, because kids need a lot of a lot of education around safe behaviors with LPG because it's a compressed gas. And whereas, whereas that's just not a challenge for us. It's an uncompressed liquid, it's vaporization, but there's no risk of explosion. So once customers sort of understand these nuances saying, well, a lot of people, you know, not we, we, we don't like it, but a lot of people call us cocoa gas in the market because that's the mental anchoring that they have. You know, they're like, oh, well, this is a, you know, it's a better form of gas, um, and and in terms of solving some of the affordability and 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 safety pain points that gas has in the minds of the consumers. But we try and, you know, our our our, our fleet of micro tankers have, you know, cocoa fuel. We have, you know, not gas, not charcoal, not kerosene. We don't say what it is because no one knows, you know. But we just we we start that conversation and oh, okay, what is it then? And uh, and and rather than spending a lot of time getting into you know, technical discussions around what ethanol is and so on. That's all nice for the supply chain folks and for, for the cooking nerds amongst us. But but uh, for customers, it's really what is the experience? Um, and and uh, and we give them a gas-like experience for much cheaper and it's safer. And all of those 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 nasty problems with biomass and kerosene that you that they're very familiar with, but have been you know, generally been things that have been you know accepted by customers because of affordability. Um, whilst they aspire to modern cooking. Right now, now they can access modern cooking. They have customers say things like, "I never thought I could have, I never thought I could afford a double burner. I always thought a double, you know, you know the fact that they are, are really taking a big step up in life um, from a from a in a very tangible sense um, in terms of this day to day cooking activity." So that's 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 how, you know, that's how we do the first two and a half percent of a neighborhood, and then the you know then the next ten percent, and and how it then tips and becomes becomes something that uh, you know is never going to be a hands off activity. Um, and, and, and post, you know, post sale customer service and that sort of brand experience around it working and making sure the damn things never stock out and, and making sure the fuel quality is right. And all of that is required, like in any other energy industry. Um, so the, the, the stoves, you know, are an important part of it, but it's that experience around the, 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 the refill, the use that is just as important. Yeah, the experience is, is really just the critical part, as you've mentioned, um, from the sort of how you access the fuel and the refilling, but also just the cooking experience, right? It has to be um, at least as good or ideally better than, than what people have now. So um, great. Uh, let's move over to uh, Rocio. Um, 
I know uh, you touched on this a little bit, but maybe you could highlight um, just a little bit more sort of how you think about uh, marketing cooking products um, differently than some of the other products in your portfolio, like off-grid um, electric products. So if you could just talk a little bit more about about how that yeah. differs for consumers. It, it is, um, so we have several cooking solutions. We, we market simultaneously um, LPG, uh, charcoal stove, and EPC. We even sell in EPCs uh, recently. Um, so it, it kind of, we are contradicting <laughs> all the time our, our, ourselves. But I think it's up, to the, it's up to the user to decide what the priorities are. And we all know that they use multiple devices, the same as I use multiple devices, and you probably use multiple devices. So let's assume this is this is the way everybody in the world wants to cook with multiple devices. So let's pass that conversation and, and move forward and therefore give them the choice of how they want to cook depending on the needs. So we do know that LPG, especially in the rural areas, is not used for every single meal. Um, is used at breakfast time, boiling water in the evening to reheat the main meal that is being cooked in a more traditional way. So, so be it, right? That's the way it is. So we don't push any product in front of the other at all. Um, and we let uh, the consumers to decide what they want to buy. And what happens in reality is that, especially in the cooking side of things, less in the solar side, is that they will buy one product and then they will buy another one. So we we have we, we see that the repeat behavior happens within the same category. So I, I buy an LPG today, takes me six months to pay off, take a breather, and then I enter into another contract to buy a charcoal stove and, and so on. And you have all these combinations. Uh, and then I buy a fancy double burner, which we also offer. And then eventually some people buy an EPC if they are lucky enough to be electrified. So we are not discriminating one product against the other one. That's, that's for sure. It, do, it does become complicated because you can imagine for the salesperson uh, having a range uh, of products, uh, the, the wider the you range, the more complex is the, is the message. And you don't have infinite amount of time when you do your, your products, your, your product presentations in front of an audience. Um, so we always have this internal debate about focus versus diversification in terms of the product range. Is it better to focus on a few of them or is it worth expanding the product range? We always turn our clients say, add, add, add all the time. Why don't you sell smartphones? Why don't you sell TVs? Uh, why don't you sell season fertilizers? And we go like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. We are not going to add everything, right? We need to be super careful because when you have a catalog of 100 products for the salesperson, I still haven't seen a single model out there beyond e-commerce that has a clear instructions from a marketing point of view. What do you push? What we are playing right now is seasonalities. So seasonalities in the countryside are very strong. So obviously um, uh, products which are linked to your agricultural season are only relevant a few months per year. But cooking and solar don't have seasonality. Cooking and solar demand is pretty stable across the year. So we are trying to be smart on that one, but it's hard, it's really hard. And um, at the end of the day, the, the message is always the same. What, what is this, you know, what is the deal here? How much money and how much time am I going to save if, if I invest in X, Y, Z? It's as simple as that. You do the math and people, and people find the solution by themselves. Um, and, and that's really our role. We are not here to tell them, you know, LPG is better than, than charcoal, than APC is better, da, 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 da. That's, that's really, um, we, we can explain you know, what happens, but in Kenya, the awareness is already there. People know what LPG is. They are not users, but they are aware of it. They are scared of it. They have this perception that it's going to explode and you know, fancy people in the cities could be this. So our role is to uh, do a little bit of education. So we need to educate clients. The EPCs are completely not a new product that needs a lot of education. But you know, if I see my neighbor using it, you know, the education part is, is, is very, very easy. Um, once, once you have uh, your, your own clients embedded, embedded in the system, um, and that's what we are trying to do. Otherwise, how do you accelerate the word of mouth if you don't, you know, increase uh, the number of participants in this chain of, of uh, virtual circle of, of trust, trust, really? This is all about trust and creating trust in the new technology. Yeah, we have heard that time and time again um, when we thought about 
you know, how do you how do you increase awareness or increase demand for these products? And time and again, we hear from people that it's all about word of mouth and hearing from your neighbors and your friends. And um, it's so true, but it's also so hard to scale, right? So <laughs> um, you can sort of scale it within in a, in a community and hope that it spreads and spreads and spreads. Um, but it does it does take I don't time. Know. So we we copy Tupperware. I don't know if you are mm -hmm. Tupperware. Yeah, of course, yeah. But Tupperware, Avon, Amway, all these direct selling um, techniques, so these direct selling models, they are all based on word of mouth. Mm -hmm. They are cooking gadgets that are sold in Europe only through word of mouth. You cannot physically buy them, not even in the internet. It's like robots that you buy, you know, super hot in Spain, but they are made in Germany. So this, is, this goes across borders. I don't think there is necessarily... Uh, a cultural limit on the leveraging of social networks and, and use of word of mouth. I think it's a fundamental human um, trait that we are always, we are linked, we are part of society, you like it or not. So I'm, 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 more, pos I'm more optimistic about the scalability of word of mouth. Um, but my role as a company is to accelerate that because if you passively wait for that to happen, is going to be 2025 before you know we break even, right? Um, and and that's one of one of the questions, are, especially in the NGO sector, which they are more like, you know, more traditional and passive. Um, they let the users or they let the beneficiaries to solve the, the problems, and I think that's a little bit naive. And I think you need to invest in accelerating that that richer circle of trust. Uh, and it's not easy. We we don't know. We are still experimenting. We are still um, tweaking, um, you know, what is it? What is it need for you to do that? Why will you become a Tupperware lady? So you really need to come out with a value proposition for the Tupperware lady, which is slightly different from the Tupperware user. Um, and you, you already creating segmentations within your own client market, and it becomes a bit complicated. Uh, but but that's it. That's really my role. I'm just there to to, to push people and do it faster than if you were waiting and seeing what happens. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll use that opportunity to to segue into a question about the sort of third part of the, the title of this, um, this panel discussion, which is, um, you know, we all want this to happen faster and we all want to do what we can to help accelerate this transition. And so, you know, is there anything that you see that, um, you know, the, the CCA or other advocates or could be the government um, can do to help that go faster. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about awareness raising, but perhaps it's about educating people about the safety of LPG or um, implementing standards or, or anything. Is there is there something that, that you can think of that I'm copying this or broader I, ecosystem can do I, to help I, that? I'll copy Peter. I think <laughs> the biggest barrier here for um, access to clean solutions is affordability. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about um, this particular problem. Um, the consumer finance is missing. There's a huge gap there. Uh, I still don't understand why. I do not understand why the traditional lenders are so allergic to uh, uh, enter in, in consumer finance deals. I don't understand why they are so prejudiced against rural women. I don't understand why they're still using uh, 19th century credit scoring uh, things. Where is your pay slip? I mean, come on, 70% of people in Kenya live off the land, what pay slips? So I do not understand why the consumer finance is stuck in, in another century compared to India. We heard from Niha. India is like 10 years ahead of us. Consumer finance and the MFI world got it. And they are embedded with the manufacturers and the distributors. And they are pushing all these products, water filters, clean cooking, LPG, solar, everything, because they got it. The default rates, my default rates are, are, are negligible. We have the track record and they still don't care. There is, I don't know what's missing there. To me, it's a prejudice, but maybe I'm, I'm a bit harsh and I'm, I'm just criticizing people I don't know directly. But, um, you know, I have a track record to prove that my clients, which are low-income rural women, are able to pay the loans. Nothing is changing. Yeah. I that's wish we all my, knew, right? That's, that's, that's <laughs> my, my shout. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's it's sort of, yeah, the crux of all of this, right, is how do you make everything more affordable? And if if others are not going to participate in that, it makes it super, super difficult. Um, great. So let's uh, let's move over to Peter um, and maybe sort of build on, on some of the points Rocio is making about 
um, particularly the the electric uh, pressure cookers, because I know that's a new new product, relatively new for burn. Um, so just curious, um, you know, what what has surprised you the most about how households have responded to that sort of new product in your line um, compared to what you've seen perhaps for charcoal or wood or even LPG? Sure. Well, I think one thing to, to um, remember about at least customers in, in Nairobi and urban Kenya is that they are surprisingly, or not surprisingly, but they're real rational economic actors. So for them to make githeri, the cheapest way for them to make githeri, which is this bean and, and corn dish, whatever, is with uh, this, with our cocoa or with the, with another super fuel efficient charcoal stove. So, you know, it's, it's like three times cheaper than LPG. Um, and so, you know, this idea that people are going to move up this kind of energy ladder is this, I mean, I think we're, we're, we don't really talk about it that way, but in terms of stove stacking, it's like people will have stove to make their githeri, they'll have, you know, LPG uh, for the fast cooking meals. And so people are like hyper price sensitive. So when that comes over to our work with EPC is that even though we tell them that now electric pressure cooking is the cheapest way that you can make githeri, they, you know, seeing is believing so that they'll turn off every light in their house, turn the thing on and then see how many units it consume. So it's like people are making these like decisions based on a couple of shillings, right? So it's like the difference between 10 and 16 shillings for a meal, people are tracking that. And I think that until the prices of fuel change or that, that mix changes, people are gonna continue to use charcoal if charcoal is the cheapest way to make that one dish they're going to use LPG or ethanol for doing these other things. Um, and so, um, yeah. And then I guess just also the the findings that we're seeing with, with pressure cooking is that actually people are fairly familiar with it. So people, electric pressure, or sorry, pressure cookers have been there, but not electric. So it's actually, it's because it's so much safer and easier to use. And it's, we're surprised at how quickly people are picking it up. They're learning to really interact with the device. And they're not like, again, there's this sort of, you know, Western bias that these are people are very culturally conservative and they just, you know, they're, they're not taking up these new technologies because it's just too weird for them. That's often, you know, bad design is often blamed on that. They're like, we blew the design, but let's blame it on the, on the cook. So yeah, we're seeing, um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're seeing like willingness to pay the, the pilots that we've run that there's been, um, yeah, strong demand, strong and strong uptake, as long as we can prove them around pricing. Um, what else could I say about that? Um, yeah, I think that's really it for, for electric. I guess for us, you know, the big opportunity with electric is that the fuel is already there. With every other system, you have to bring LPG, you have to bring ethanol, you have to bring charcoal, to bring kerosene to the house. People already have access to the grid and that is, so that's there already. So then when you tell them that now that's gone from the most expensive form of cooking to the cheapest, it's kind of a, a no brainer for people. So we've seen people in the pilot who's like a um, like grid or their grid connection in their house, not being good enough. And we said, well, we're gonna take it away because it's a fire hazard. They're like, no, no, we'll upgrade the electricity in our apartment to do this. So um, yeah, I think that's really a, you know, a game changer, especially in countries that have high, um, uh, number of people on the grid, like Kenya, which is 56 to 70 percent of people people on the grid. Um, yeah, and then I think the question was, what can we do to stimulate demand from the government or CCA or government, whoever? You know, I think Greg and I always say this whenever we're talking. So it's just like, of course, you have to get rid of VAT. So VAT went back in Kenya, which was which was a huge uh, blow. But like, yeah, all, all like CCA should just, if they just did nothing, but like created sensible like duty taxation VAT schemes, that's the game changer. Because again, well, Rocio is just agreeing with me when I said originally it's price. Like if we're gonna sit around and wait for end consumer financing to solve this, for many of these products, it's not gonna happen. You have to bring the price down and we do that through value engineering. We do it through um, subsidies where needed or bundling as Greg re re referenced it to, um, but also like VAT and duty have huge impl implications on that. And so obviously as a local manufacturer, we believe that it's like, it's it's important to protect manufacturing on the continent and create like businesses that are truly nested um, in place. And so, um, you know, we think it's, you know, we're not over removing duties 
on imported goods, but we need to create a sensible level playing field um, across across the spectrum. And so CCA should just do that. Like no behavior change, no no standards and testing, no like all so many of those things that, which I guess you guys have really moved away from in the um, which is great. But it's like how do you make products more affordable and how do you support people to pilot these new products because it's a huge very long iterative process to make these to make these new products so pilots and removing tap vat duty tariffs that would be my thing is what you guys could do i always say the same thing but i'm saying it <laughs> yes i've heard that one before but yeah no i mean i we're very, very much aware of the implications of the change in the vat and um you know our, our you know, hoping that we can figure out how to to overturn that and and support all of you guys. Um, it's also just a you know a very difficult thing, right? Where the government um, you know needs to raise tax revenue to function as well, and so it's 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 a hard case to make. But we're committed to supporting you all and in, in, in making it. But I don't want to get too much into the VAT issue. Uh, no, um, sure. And okay. not for Kenya specifically. I meant just in general across the continent, across all right. markets. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yep. thanks. Um, great. So uh, it looks like we have a couple of questions. So maybe we'll turn it over to um, sharing some of those from the audience. Uh, maybe we'll go back to Rocio. We have a question about uh, how does your business model differ from Living Goods? Living Goods. Who is Living Goods again? Remind me. I'm always confused with this one. Living Goods, they do health products, right? Uh, I believe they have a yeah, fairly have, similar model and yeah. that they they uh, sell a range of products, mostly um, more but like fast moving consumer goods. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the, the sort of basket. The business, of, yeah, it's yeah. a business in a bag. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you have like nutritional products and maybe a lamp or whatever. Yeah, fine. Very different. We First of all, we don't use agents. Uh, so we don't do buy and resell. Uh, second, we everything we do, we do it on credit, which I doubted that these fast-moving consumer goods are sold on credit. So even even just you know, the moment you introduce credit, you know, forget about it. Uh, your the business model is very very different from a traditional agent base uh, buy and resell. Or I get a basket of products and I go to my community and sell a packet of sugar at a time. Very very different. Okay, uh, uh, looks like we have another one and encourage people to submit more questions. We have about a little over 10 minutes left. So please uh, keep sending your questions. Uh, this one is for Peter um, and it's a, it's about uh, the price comparisons between um, I guess charcoal stoves versus LPG uh, and wondering if an efficient charcoal stove is three times cheaper than LPG if you take into account uh, cook, cooking time and pot cleaning time. Um, and sort of the more broader, broad question is, uh, do, do you think that consumers or customers consider this full range of factors when they're cho choosing a stove? So not just, I guess, the monetary cost, but also the, the sort of time and opportunity cost of that, of, of time spent cleaning and pots and preparing food. I don't know. No, I, cause I would think just generally speaking, I think people don't put a dollar amount towards their time so that obviously they, sh you know, they should value their time and free time is important, but I don't think when they're weighing the economics of it, they're looking at it as this meal cost me X cents versus the other. So they're not, I, I don't think they are, but I mean, that's an interesting question to be honest. I've never, we've never put our market research team on that and no, uh, well, I could send, I could share a table around of sort of the price difference, but um, yeah, using an inefficient charcoal stove is, uh, I have to go back and look exactly at my table. It's maybe the same as LPG or maybe a little bit less than LPG. And it also depends on how you run LPG. And so this is an interesting question. Like, I don't know how uh, Greg and those guys are, are working on it, but people in Kenya often will boil at high power and they don't simmer. So people are like, ah, we don't simmer in Kenya. So people, you know, it depends on how the user is using each of each of those stoves. Um, anyways, yeah. So there's that's it's not a perfect comparison necessarily, but yeah. But I don't know if we got to the root of what that person's question was, but 
<laughs> yeah, and I think it's one of those inherent things, right? That even if you ask someone, I don't know that they could say that they're necessarily valuing that time um, of, of preparation. It's sort of inherently, they're thinking about it from a convenience perspective, but probably not counting the minutes necessarily. So um, great, it looks like we had another question uh, for Greg that he uh, answered in the chat, but um, maybe just uh, in case people didn't see, the question was, um, to Greg, why don't you open up your ethanol outlets slash cocoa points to competing suppliers of ethanol stoves? Yeah, and I put a link there to an announcement that we made actually at the Clean Cooking Alliance thing, Shindig in Nairobi last year. Um, you know, philosophically, we're building an open platform, um, but um, we have invested tens of millions of dollars in building this platform. And we it is our brand, they're our customers, we're responsible for the product, we, we ensure, for example, um, the, 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 the product liability around our stoves, around our fuel, around uh, the Cocoa Point fuel ATMs inside the store. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into, you know, the, when you're thinking about solving for, again, for this, this, this dirty fuels challenge, um, there's just a lot of component parts to it. You know, stoves are important, but they're a small part of the overall solution and they have to fit in with the overall solution. And when it comes to, um, when it comes to safety and performance and quality, um, they're things that we can't, we can't take, you know, we can't cut corners on. You know, if if someone comes in with a, you know, with with a sort of a V1.0 ethanol stove that's that's less efficient, then that directly translates into higher perceptions, right? That cu customers have high, higher cost perceptions they have around the fuel price, right? And so and who you know and so so the word of mouth then um, uh, becomes negative uh, because you've got an underperforming stove that's been sold through our network that makes people think that the category is more expensive. Right, and so we have standards. Um, we, we wrote the, the legal standards in Kenya for ethanol-based appliances, and we made sure that, that Evron stoves were able to be sold, but that in terms of our standards that we set, um, safety and performance and quality uh, are critical. And so, yeah, we, we, we announced a, a collaboration program about a year ago. There's some companies that we're working with that want to um, basically license. We're not gonna charge any, 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 anything other than cost for the smart valve, the safety valve that goes into people's stoves so that they can plug in. And we think that there's a whole range of appliances that could be built that, that ultimately, you know, that ultimately, uh, you know, hang off our platform. But, um, but yeah, there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be standards and of course, commercial considerations that we'll have to get into with those folks. Um, so that so that the brand, you know, what we're building is a huge consumer brand. It's not tarnished. You know, that's really important to us. Great, thank you. And that all makes perfect sense. Uh, so I don't see any additional questions from the audience, but if, if you do have additional ones, please send those through. So maybe I'll just ask uh, one last question of all of the panelists and, and Peter sort of touched on this a bit, but um, and maybe I'll frame it a little bit differently than than I had before. But basically, if you had to go back to your former self when you first started working um, on clean cooking on this sector, um, if there's one piece of advice you could give yourself about uh, consumers and and how to build demand for your products, what would what would that be? And maybe I'll start with uh, Rocio. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, totally underestimated the power of networking. Totally. So we were so worried about uh, entering into lending um, and how on earth are we going to do the credit scoring, the credit checks and all that, that we completely underestimated or underrepresented the power of networks for the um, marketing side of things and creating awareness. Uh, that, that came as a surprise, uh, which was a very nice surprise, by the way. And, and then that's when I read everything about direct marketing and Tupperware and, and Amway and multi-level marketing and single level marketing and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I, I think that surprised me. Uh, all the things that uh, we refrain from is trying to draw conclusions without really understanding. I'm, I'm not a user of charcoal. So I'm the least qualified person to draw a conclusion about cost customer's preferences. So um, that's, that's one of the things that we always, always refrain from. And every decision that we take has to be based on some kind of data that we collect ourselves, because otherwise, uh, yeah, if you listen to the noise, uh, charcoal is better than LPG, LPG is better than charcoal, my technology is better than yours. Me as a distributor, which I'm product agnostic, my job is really difficult. So we try to not listen to the noise and we try to get a first um, data or first-hand data from the users themselves. And we do lots of 
experimentation ar around that. Hey, use the EPC for a week. Let me know what you think. Um, but otherwise, I, I would recommend to everybody to do that. To try not to listen to the noise because otherwise you get super confused. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, let's go over to Peter. If you had to go back to your former self uh, when you just started out in, in clean cooking, what would you have? To, what would you tell yourself about uh, consumers and, and creating demand? Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's funny because you know uh, we sell a lot through supermarkets, and so our consumers sometimes are our distributors, which are supermarkets, and that. Um, I would have told myself not to trust these big supermarkets in Kenya from not going out of business and stealing all my money. Um, so that one, my, that I would have been surprised to say like the least viable customer was what appeared to be the most viable. Um, again, yeah, I would just say what, just kind of reiterate what I said last time is that it's just so important to do the market research, trust, to trust that as opposed to your gut, like this just feels right. So it, that is a deep ongoing like weekly conversation of a product market fit. Um, so yeah, so I just don't trust myself anymore. So it's easy. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. You should never assume anything is, is something I learned very early on in life. Um, always ask. Uh, great, let's go over to Greg. What would you tell former Greg uh, when he's just starting out in clean cooking? <laughs> Jeez, that, that foolish young boy. <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, I suppose I'd echo echo um, Peter's comments around um, around just constant market intelligence and reassessment and reassessment of product market fit. Um, that's one thing I think. Um, uh, you know, right now we we forty percent of the retail price of the stoves is going in toll gate taxes and VAT and tariffs, um, and so I I uh, I definitely. You know, the sort of stuff that we're doing now around um, uh, around lobbying. You know, we've had lobbyists for a couple of years, and but the sort of moves that we're making around policy change, not just in Kenya but elsewhere. Um, I'd start them earlier um, because ultimately it just is is just a little bit nuts seeing all of these you know reasonably small um, multilateral development type programs that are trying to get RBF after years and years and years to get. You know, ten bucks or something to a to a to to, to, to uh, as a subsidy to these to these uh, customers, and and you know, pretty much that's just a merry-go-round going straight straight to the governments. It's not going to the customers um, because the governments haven't necessarily connected the, the 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 cost of the baseline dirty fuels reality and what the you know the reality that that charcoal is a taxation on agriculture and agricultural yields and and is hurting treasury etc. And, and health sector and so on, right? And so 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 being a bit more aggressive around. Um, around the the policy stuff, um, you know, we're 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 thinking, you know, really seriously right now about, you know, basically agreements with governments as a prerequisite to prioritizing their country for building our, our networks um, uh, around tax and tariff exemptions for ten years, like other strategic, you know, investments in their in 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 in, in core infrastructure in their country, um, the sorts of you know the sorts of major project status that you get in other sectors we think is necessary for these sectors in order to remove this ridiculousness around toll gate taxes. And so I'd spend, you know, we've spent, we've spent a huge amounts of money reducing the price of the fuel and, 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 and figuring out how to do business model innovation, engineering and technology innovation to, to lower the cost of the appliance. Um, uh, uh, yet there's still such a such a heavy burden of toll gate taxation. So we'd, you know, we'd probably aggressively invest in that as well. Um, and, and, and I'd echo Peter's call that, that, um, that the international community that cares about um, you know, uh, the uptake of clean cooking should get, you know, should roll the sleeves up around lobbying far more aggressively than has occurred to date. And the proper sort of K Street stuff that goes in the US, you know, that's the sort of lobbying that's required here as well. Not, not, you know, not generic friendly, you know, group hug type meetings, but 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 literally going in and, and, and finding a way to, um, to 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 solve for taxes and tariffs and aligned interests and you know, get some vested, vested interest in a legitimate legal way. You know, these are things that I think can can deliver an outcome around toll gate taxes that ultimately is going to enable you to get into poorer segments and grow, you know, grow market share, solve this problem. So, you know, I think that that's probably one of the lessons. Um, invest more in policy change directly and try and, you know, corral in well wishes uh, from, from the international community that want to get on that train as well. 
Got it. Thank you, Greg. Um, and looks like we are right at the hour. So just wanted to uh, thank our panelists today for a great discussion. Um, I think we heard uh, some some themes throughout that seem to um, come to the forefront, which is that it's all about the users and the experience that you create for them. Um, that word of mouth is is so critical, and and uh, you know the way that these types of uh, innovations spread. And then um, ultimately, it's also all about the affordability and how do you how do you address that? Um, and obviously, policy and and lowering um, taxes is one way to do that. So. Um, those are some of the, the key themes I think we heard today. Um, and again, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you also to those listening. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Peter, uh, Peter George, uh, to introduce our next speaker. And thank you all again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, it's been another really interesting day, starting with the lightning talks uh, from some of the true innovators in the market, moving on to this really important discussion about, about consumers and uh, you know the recognition that they are really the ultimate foundation and determinant of success to everything we do. 